proud, forgotten, Indian. We're out of time for people to think about themselves separately. We're, we only have time to be a nation of two-leggeds. And we're to treat all people with respect and honor, even when we don't have that respect returned to us. If we take what's good out of this canoe over here, of the greater society and the European people who came to our country, we take what's good out of our Indian canoe and we put it in one canoe and we go forward with it. Production of immense possibilities is made possible by the generous support of the Earth and Humanity Foundation. Wendy Selden. Rogue Co-ops, a community-centered collaboration among the Ashland Food Co-op, the Grange Co-op, Rogue Credit Union, and the Medford Food Co-op, Cliff Bar and Company, Elizabeth York, and these additional members of the Immense Possibilities Community Builders Circle. Welcome to our weekly visit with people who are creating immense possibilities for healthy communities, solutions to all kinds of challenges. Tonight we highlight an important component of many communities that doesn't get enough accurate and clarifying light. It's a minority culture whose struggles are magnified by the larger culture's biases, misreadings of history, and simple ignorance. Many of us forget about these people altogether, about three million people nationwide, until some cultural flashpoint burns hot enough to grab our attention. Something like the mascot of a professional football team. Proud. Forgotten. Indian. Navajo. Blackfoot. Inuit and Sioux. Survivor. Spiritualist. Patriot. Sitting Bull. Hiawatha. And Jim Thorpe. Mother, father, son, daughter, chief. Apache, Pueblo, Choctaw, Chippewa, and Crow. Underserved, struggling, resilient. Squanto, Red Cloud. Tecumseh and Crazy Horse, Rancher, Teacher, Doctor, Soldier, Seminole, Seneca, Mohawk, and Creek, Mills, Will Rogers, Geronimo, Unyielding, Strong, Indomitable. Native Americans call themselves many things. The one thing they don't. That spot from the National Congress of American Indians was produced to air in the 2014 Super Bowl, but never did. Still, the issue that prompted it says a lot about the chasm of misunderstanding that still remains between Native Americans and those of us whose ancestors came later. Tonight, we hope to narrow that chasm a bit. My first guests are David West, who's director of the Native American Studies Department at Southern Oregon University, and Patricia Halloran, a student who has worked and studied in that program over the years. Welcome to you both. Thanks for coming to Immense Possibilities. Thanks for having us. David, tell us a bit about where you're from and your tribal background. I was born in Klamath Falls. I'm Potawatomi, Miami, and Kickapoo, as well as Dutch and French. Uh, I am the American experience, uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. How diverse are the students who come to your department, and what are they looking for? We've found that our students are incredibly uh, diverse. Uh, we've had international students since I've been here at the university. This is my 20th year. And we've always had a great interest from other countries, from people from other countries, and particularly indigenous people from other countries. They want to know who are these American Indians. 
and they come with many, many questions and a huge number of stereotypes and misconceptions that have been given them by the movies, by videos, uh, by books and things, the dime novels. Let's go right there. What are the strongest stereotypes that remain and that cause problems or misunderstanding? I've found that to be over, over my years and my experience. Um, a continued belief that many American Indian people are unemotional, unfeeling, uncaring, the stoic Indian, uh, that we don't cry, that we have no emotion. Uh, some of the worst things that were done towards us were that uh, Indian men did not respect or love their women, uh, that they beat their kids, that they were drunks, they were lazy and shiftless, smelled bad, uh, all kinds of things that have been used in the vernacular of the time, the language of the time. Now, we got aware of that 20 or 30 years ago. We looked at our history books, saw what those stereotypes were like, and agreed that it wasn't a great thing. Have things improved much? I believe so, and our young people are the ones that are changing that perception. Our young people are moving forward. We want to be included, but we don't necessarily want to assimilate. We don't want to change who we are. We want to be who we are. Uh, in fact, some of our elders joke about maybe that we could make a, uh, an offer that maybe you want to assimilate with us. Um, <laughs> and some of our captive stories uh, and things kind of lead to that, that many people who were taken in the long ago in the Indian Wars, when they came uh, to rescue them, they didn't go back. They didn't want to go back. They chose to stay with the Indian people. I'm really glad you brought that up because it brings me to a conversation that I had with you, Patricia, before we started about uh, a certain timeliness to Native American teachings and the environmental awareness in this country and some of the environmental battles. You started telling me about the, the cowboy and Indian alliance that's happening right now, which is one example of some coming together that we haven't seen before. Um, the cowboy and, and Indian alliance actually started in the 1980s in response to uranium mining in South Dakota. And there's always been that kind of connection since then of um, people who live in, you know, particularly in the Midwest where there's been a lot of mining issues, a lot of um, destruction of the environment. And in modern day, this uh, controversial uh, Keystone Pipeline is, has brought these communities together again. The rally came four days after Earth Day, when a group of ranchers, farmers and tribal communities from along the pipeline route rode into Washington, D.C., and set up the Reject and Protect encampment near the White House. The group called themselves the Cowboy Indian Alliance. During Saturday's procession, members of the alliance presented a hand-painted teepee to the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian as a gift to President Obama. The teepee represented the Cowboy and Indian Alliance's hopes for protected land and clean water. I believe that we live in a time where we don't have any more room for separation. We don't have any more room for this, you know, us and them mentality. We are faced with incredible issues, incredible problems, you know, the, the health of our planet. Native American beliefs around the environment has definitely influenced the larger culture and the larger culture of even, in, you know, an environmental awareness. In the midst of all this comes World Peace and Prayer Day that, that you're getting very involved with. Tell us a little bit about that. This is the 20th year anniversary of World Peace and Prayer Day and Sacred Sites Day. It was a request for all peoples of the world to go to their sacred sites, the place that was important to them. And on the 21st of June, which is the summer solstice, for many Native American people, that's a high holy day that uh, solstice and the height of the sun is at its zenith. Um, its power is manifest in that day. And to go there and pray for peace in the world, uh, no matter what faith, no matter what people, no matter where you were in the world, with a focus on praying for the earth. If someone has a need or feels that they would like to be involved with this day and this ceremony celebration, that they can if they are unsure what to pray for. Um, they can pray for the earth and the continued well-being and balance of all our relations on the earth and the interconnectedness and interdependency of all life one to the other. And that's what the day is about. It's going to your sacred site. Pray in your church, your mosque, your temple, wherever it is that uh, you go for spiritual sustenance. And so this beautiful waking up of people is not about indigenous people only. We're out of time. We're out of time for people to think about themselves separately. 
We're, we only have time to be a nation of two-legged. It's going to take each and every one of us, no matter what little thing you think it is that you're doing. At one of these uh, World Peace and Prayer Days in Japan, there were 9,000 people who attended. So it's in Japan. It's making huge impact around the world and helping people to come to a focus with other human beings around the world for one prayer. And by manifesting that one prayer, there's power in that. We're hoping that that really opens up a dialogue and specifically in our communities, um, both native and non-native, to look at the local issues that we're facing environmentally, um, look at our waters, look at our, our air, look at our earth, and um, kind of bring that into people's minds and consciousness more and help collaborate and form these networks. And stop thinking of it as Native American or non-Native American issues, but as our issues. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I often ask my students, how many of you run down and take a big drink out of Bear Creek with me? Hmm. Not I a don't lot get of many hands. takers. Hmm. How many go down and have a big drink out of the Rogue? How about the Illinois? Oh no, maybe above Tacoma. So we can't drink the water. What does that say to us? If we don't have water on the earth, we're all done. And it won't matter if you're red, yellow, black, or white, uh, whether you're green or whether you're brown, it won't matter. Uh, it, with no water, there's no life. I'd like to hear your thoughts a bit about assimilation. It strikes me that it could be an ongoing dilemma for young native people, uh, to the pull uh, and the importance of understanding and preserving the old tradition and the call of economic opportunity and the pressures to fit into the dominant culture in order to maximize your opportunities out in the world. We can still be who we are and achieve our goals and our dreams, our ec educational visions, if you will, as who we are. It, there used to be a thing about we live in two worlds, one foot in two canoes. We've changed that now and to come to a perspective as American Indian people of we take what's good out of this canoe over here of the greater society and the European people who came to our country. We take what's good out of our Indian canoe and we put it in one canoe and we go forward with it. We don't have to give up anything of who we are and why should we? Why should we be required for, of that? Why don't you come join us? Um, maybe you might find something that you might want to be a part of. Plenty of room in that canoe? Plenty of room in that canoe. If our viewers take away just one thing from our conversation this evening, what would you like it to be? I think I would like them to realize that we are still here. We're not gone. We're not relegated to a museum. Native American people are all around you. Their influence is all around you. Take the time to look at them as who they are as human beings, not something on the pages of a dime store novel, but as human beings and their contributions to the country that you live in. David West heads the Native American Studies Department at Southern Oregon University. Patricia Halloran has been an anthropology major, worked in that department and with its activities for a while. Thanks both for coming and sharing this on Immense Possibilities with us. Thank you so much Thank for you. having us. You're welcome. We all love our kids and we all have the gift of uh, compassion and the gift of uh, responsibility, equal responsibility in order for this earth to survive. It's got to be peace and harmony. That's that balance that we have to create. Right now, it's not happening. So that's the message that I strongly have a input in on is that we are going to create this. We're going to make history. And we can, this new millennium, we're going to uh, make a change. Not far south of the Oregon-California line, near the rural town of Fort Jones, lies the Quartz Valley Indian Reservation, a federally recognized tribe that owns and operates the Anav Tribal Health Clinic. The clinic's director, Kyle Nelson, joins me now. Kyle, welcome to Immense Possibilities. It's good to have you here. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Give us a taste of your story, uh, kind of where you grew up, your tribal background, and the choices you made to, to be educated. I grew up in Weaverville, California. I'm an enrolled member of the Karuk tribe. I'm also um, uh, ethnically Maidu, Paiute, and Pitt River tribes from uh, my mom's side of the family. My mom still lives in Weaverville. I uh, moved away in about uh, 1989 after graduation. I worked at a sawmill 
for a little while and then got into the construction trades and I, I loved doing that work. I loved working with my hands and working with wood and concrete and building things and being able to look back at the end of a job and seeing something that had been built from nothing. Um, I had also um, fell into some, um, I would say, um, negative behaviors and um, was also fond of um, uh, alcohol and other drugs to excess and by the time I was 30 years old then I had um, gone into a residential treatment center for Native American men called uh, Three Rivers Indian Lodge in Manteca, California. The people who I was working with and who were working with me and the professionals that were uh, available to, to talk with and, and, uh, and uh, help me along, I was inspired by them and I decided during that 90 to one year time, uh, 90 day to one year time of period in my life that I wanted to be like them. These are people that had backgrounds like mine, but they were there and they were they were there for me to help me. And I, I felt strongly drawn to the um, to that type of work. So um, I'd never been to college and um, I didn't know. Uh, about enrolling in college, so I went to the local community college and um, walked up to the admissions desk and said, "I, I, I don't want, I don't know, really know what to do, but um, I want to go to school and I have, I want to do some things." And these things fell into place for me, and I got the classes that I needed, and I finished the junior college, and then I went to, um, I went to uh, Sonoma State University and graduated with a um, degree in psychology, and then I went to graduate school at UC Berkeley and um, finished a master's degree in social work and then a second master's degree in public health. As you advanced through your studies, do you think your ethnic background was any kind of factor? Did it give people any uh, attitudes or expectations? Or did you feel any of that? I don't know that I felt it so much other than um, the, the occasional comments, uh, comments such as, um, um, oh, he's in Berkeley. Now, um, like surprised people. Surprised. He's in Berkeley. I uh, must be because of being able to, you know, being Native American and uh -huh. being able to, to get in the door that way. And, and so I thought, what a privilege it is to be of a um, race or ethnicity that people don't question that. If people who are viewing tonight, most of whom are not Native, can take one memory and understanding away from the conversation we've been having with folks in this program, what would you like it to be? I'd say don't be okay with inequalities. Don't be okay with health disparities, whether it is um, higher rates of disease in certain ethnic groups or in certain places um, where we live. The public health approach is to go and look, uh, look at the research and do a blanket approach across the United States. And that approach hasn't worked. There's still um, health disparities. There are um, higher rates of diabetes and heart disease and um, and all sorts of social ills in the Native American community still after you know, all of the healthcare delivery and all the money that we spend in healthcare. It's been well documented that cultural preservation, that cultural revitalization, that cultural practices play an important role in uh, Native communities for prevention. So if, if there are positive things like basket making, like uh, traditional food gathering and hunting, um, then that is something that uh, that is a positive influence that, that keeps us grounded, keeps us uh, from moving into more destructive behaviors. What is your source of inspiration or energy to keep going through? Sometimes it must be kind of discouraging. Um, my inspiration is both my family. I have this very supportive wife and my little kids, and I want, you know, I want things to be different for um, for my kids and for my grandkids. Um, my inspiration is my parents who have supported me and helped me to, you know, move move in, to the place where I'm at now, and it's the um, the tribal community, the community members that I work with, and the tribal leaders that I work with who have this vision for a um, healthy Native community for generations to come, and they're already doing so much. They're, they've they've come so far from you know colonization to the historical forces that have you know caused devastation in, in native communities um, the tribe has already come so far and there's a you know thriving education department and the environmental department and they have housing and and the people are on this role and have this forward momentum and it's really exciting to be a part of that kyle nelson is the director of the anav tribal health clinic in Fort Jones, California, the Quartz Valley Indian Reservation. Kyle, thank you very much for joining us on Immense Possibilities. 
Thanks for inviting me, Jeff. You know, God created one religion. When he created everything, he created spirits. And then he put these spirits into everything he created. And so when he come down to the two legged them the people, he created them all equal. That's the voice of the revered Lakota medicine man, Martin Highbear, who passed to the spirit world in 1995. Towards the end of his life, he and his wife, Rose, created Wisdom of the Elders. And with me now, from the Office of Wisdom of the Elders in Portland, is Rose Highbear. Rose, welcome to Immense Possibilities. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to be asked to help. Why did you and Martin create Wisdom of the Elders? Back home on Cheyenne River Indian Reservation, um, the elderlies were uh, crossing over and not leaving their wisdom and knowledge behind for the younger descendants. And so he was seeing a lot of issues coming up on Cheyenne River Reservation that he was concerned about. And he felt that we should record the elders to save their messages. And so in recent generations, we've had issues where the elders have not been able to pass that down. We have um, a few centuries of historical trauma among Native tribes and families. And so um, Martin was concerned about the passing down of the cultural values. So the spirit world gave him a vision um, of the Seven Commandments. And he was instructed to teach um, all the peoples of the world, not just his own Lakota people. And so the values, the cultural values and the spiritual traditions and the uh, even the cultural arts of the people was essential to the identity of the people, their cultural identity, their self-esteem. So if, if he was interested in, in communicating to all peoples, does that mean that this has an important value for peoples who came later, people who are not Native people? Yes, he grew up as a little boy that was beating up little white boys in La Plante, South Dakota. And so they had to work with him quite a bit to accept the fact that um, they said, one day your best friend is going to be a white guy. And so he had to work really hard on his uh, race, his own racism. It was extremely important to the vision that he was given uh, because it basically involves living in harmony on uh, Mother Earth. So we can't really have conflicts with other people, no matter what their color. They're all part of the human family. And so he struggled with it. Many, many Native people struggle with it. And I think that, you know, uh, all peoples of the world have to eventually get to the point where we're colorblind. Well, Rose, given the history of the last 150 years, it would be understandable that some Native people would have trouble doing that and that there'd be a lot of residual anger. What do you say to a younger person who comes to you very angry about hist historical circumstances and the current situation? Well, we just discussed this last Saturday in Sweat Lodge, and that's the fact that we can't carry anger in our heart uh, toward anyone, no matter what they've done to us. Because what it does, first of all, it, it disrupts our own spiritual growth, and we really can't live without growing spiritually. And so uh, what we're not also capable of giving up anger in our life without prayer. We have to ask the spirit world to help us um, to heal and to, to drop the anger. We have to remember that we are all one people, that no matter what our color, no matter what our identity, we are part of the human family. And we're to treat all people with respect and honor, even when we don't have that respect returned to us. Alongside that, do you personally think that the dominant culture has some obligation to make amends for much of what happened historically? That's really not our work. Our work is only working on ourselves. We're given one path in life, and that's our own path. So what other people do, it's up to them. Yes, we can pray for them, but it's really our own life that we work on. And so I believe that um, the history of Native people needs to be taught by Native people to the rest of the world so they can understand the greatness of our heritage, the greatness of our values, our cultural arts, uh, our ceremonies, our songs, and so many things that we have to contribute to the world. If a non-Native person was, were to be very honest and say to you, they seem lovely and I'm glad that you have them, but they don't really have anything to do with my life, what would you say? I think that's their right. They have a right to choose what's important to them in their life. And if Native American culture, heritage, and relationships are not important, they have other things they can work on. I, I You know, we can't be egocentric here and assume that 
we are the most important thing in the lives of other people. What has working with the organization that you and Martin created given to you over time? This is the most fulfilling work in my life. I'm, I'm deeply grateful for the vision we were given. It really isn't something we developed ourselves. It was given to us from the spirit world, and we're doing our very best to fulfill it. Rose Highbear created Wisdom of the Elders with her late husband, Martin Highbear. Rose, thank you very much for your work and for sharing it with us on Immense Possibilities. Thank you so much to all of you. There's no one person higher than the other. No, we need to go. Uh, doesn't matter what part of the world that you're in, you know. We're all being affected, you know, globally. And that's why I really try to uh, walk in prayer, to uh, help people understand that you know, this is, what we're up against is, uh, you know, it's got, it's got to be a spiritual unity. And that's it for this edition of Immense Possibilities. You can find out more information or send us suggestions at immensepossibilities.org. Visit our Facebook page and like and share us there. Thanks very much for watching. I'm Jeff Golden. Until next time, please do what you can do. Thanks for watching to learn about tonight's immense possibility. You can watch any of our past programs anytime at immensepossibilities.org.